broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast. iOS 11 isn't all fun and games, what we know so far and ways to handle unsupported data sets. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Heather Mahalik and Domenica Krognali, who are both SANS instructors and course authors. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, Please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Heather. Hey everyone, hopefully you can hear us okay. Um, this is one of the few times that Lee and I are actually side by side able to do this webcast together. So hopefully you don't get confused by our voices. We're not going to announce who we are each time we speak, but I think spending too much time together sometimes makes you sound like one another. Um, please ask questions at any point. We will be watching the chat window. If we're in the middle of saying something, though, we'll wait until we're done and we will get to your questions as quickly as we can. If we run out of time, our contact information is on this slide as well as the last one. So you can always email us after the fact if you think of something. And on this slide, I just want to highlight quickly, that is our new class coin. It's going to be released next month at CDI for the first time for our forensic capstone winners. For those of you who haven't read the blog yet on what's new in iOS 11, that is what this entire webcast is based upon. So we're going to quickly just introduce ourselves and then dive right into breaking down that blog post. So we're going to cover what happens when a new version of an operating system comes out, whether it's iOS or Android, it's pretty much the same for us. Um, what do we do? What does this mean for you? What did we find that was different? and tricks, techniques, and skill sets that you should actually employ to get to where we've gotten so far with iOS 11. So I'm Heather, um, work at Mantech for my day job, work at SANS for most of the rest of my hours of my day, it seems. Um, I've been doing this for about 15 years. Mobile is kind of my passion. Now, um, 585 is one of my babies, and that's the advanced smartphone course. Um, you can see down below, smarterforensics.com. That is where I blog. Um, Lee also contributes to that site, and Cindy Murphy, our other co-author, her blog is listed at the end. So the three of us do blog and post things, so it is available for you. Hi, I'm Dominica. Um, but most of you that know me personally will know me as Lee. So if you see me on the street and you yell Dominica, I may not turn around. Um, I also work at Mantech for my day job, and I've been doing uh, forensics since about 2006, focused mainly on mobile since 2009. I am new to teaching the SANS course, but I have been a co-author for 585 since uh, the beginning. And I'm available on social media and also contribute to Heather's blog. All right, so that's us. With iOS 11, um, the little joke here, did you expect nothing to change? I actually expected major changes. Um, what I've seen, iOS 7 and iOS 7 introduced changes. 7 to 8 introduced more changes. But then 8, 9, and 10 pretty much stayed consistent. Um, maps became an issue with iOS 10. So I was just expecting another big jump where they would change major file paths. Um, fortunately, that did not occur. But we are going to look at some of the major things that are kind of breaking our tools and how to deal with that. So September updates. One thing I dread is the iOS update always seems to hit while I'm teaching at a national SANS event in Vegas. And it always hits on day three, which is iOS day. And 
for those of you who teach or present, you realize that this is what occurs. People expect for you to already be prepared to teach them the morning the release comes out. So I literally sit in front of the classroom trying to update my iPhone, knowing that there's going to be major bugs and bad things are going to happen to my device, but I do it anyway to please the students and because I'm curious. So I will literally update and then I will do simple things. So I try to place a call, create a new contact, um, do SMS messages versus iMessages. So I do have friends that have Androids, if you can believe that, and I will send them messages so I can see both artifacts. Um, I will also just look at simple maps. So with that, then there's other things you have to consider. What happens if it's a brand new device out of the box running iOS 11? What if it's a jailbroken iPhone? So I literally try to do this on multiple devices, including my own. The main reason I do my own device is because I know what's on it. I know what I've tried to delete. I know who I talk to frequently. And it's easy for me to say, okay, I searched for this and now I'm gonna find it in the data. Um, I then do multiple dumps. So I will always do an iTunes backup. I will do encrypted versus not encrypted. I will then use my favorite tools um, such as UFED and do a comparison. I personally recommend you use physical analyzer to do iPhone dumps and not the UFED itself. So I will do that. I will use oxygen, um, black light, any of the other tools that are actually doing these dumps for us. And then I will also ingest all of those dumps into multiple tools and see where they're all doing things really, really oddly. If you're interested in what is going wrong tool wise, I strongly recommend you go out to the blog and read it. And the link for the blog is at the end of this. In that, I actually show screenshots on what happens if I did an iTunes backup and tried to load it into Oxygen, or what happens if I did an Oxygen dump and tried to load it into Celebrate. So you can actually see all of these differences. And with that nightmare, you can see this requires a lot of patience, which anyone who knows me knows I don't really have. So this process is usually very stressful, requires a lot of wine and a lot of digging and then a lot of dancing around and cheering when I actually find what I'm looking for. And if I don't find what I'm looking for, then it becomes dreadful for my friends like Lee, Sarah and Cindy, who I reach out to and say, what the heck is going on here? What this means, so this isn't just for iOS 11, this is every September. Um, your tools are not going to know immediately how to handle this data either. So if you literally have someone that updated on September 20th to iOS 11, and then on the 21st, you're working their device, your tools aren't going to work. That's just the bottom line. The tools also have to catch up. Um, the engineers behind these tools have to go through and do exactly the same steps that we were doing. So you are going to have to be prepared to know where data is stored on older iOS versions because most people update. So on my device, you will literally see iOS 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 because I restore my backup. So you need to know where all that data exists. Um, you need to have more than one tool. And I know some people say, well, I can't afford all of them. That's fine. There are a lot of free ones that work really, really well. Um, iBackupBot is a good example of one that you can use for free, you could use iTunes to create your dump, and then everything you're doing right there is for free. I will also tell you that a lot of the vendors will give you free trials. If you reach out to them and say, hey, I'm trying to do iOS forensics, and I'm interested in trying your tool, they will give you a demo because they want you to buy it. The worst thing you can do though is get a tool that you haven't used, use it on a case, and trust the evidence, and you'll see why, because it just doesn't make sense. And that's where you're going to need to create your own data sets. Um, you're going to have to realize that sometimes what you're doing could hurt your evidence. So you have to be very, very careful there. You also have to realize that you may be blocked from the data. So if you have a locked, let's say the iPhone 10, it's locked and you cannot get into it. You may not be able to get into it if you can't find backdoor methods to get into these devices. Um, Cindy Murphy, just wrote a blog that I think she released yesterday on, she essentially found a backdoor method to update an iOS device, an iPhone, to iOS 11 to get around the once encrypted, always encrypted issue. So if you're interested in that, I have her blog post listed at the end too, but there are ways around it. But the issue is that makes changes to the device. So it changed the background 
the screensaver and it is going to change log files and it could overwrite evidence. So you wanna make sure that you know, will your actions destroy your evidence or not? And are you willing to risk it? So back to the key artifacts. So these four things I look for on iOS specifically um, for changes and what has occurred. So since iOS 8, this has been the location for all of these file paths. It was different in iOS 7, so make sure if you're trying to use this as a cheat sheet, you know this is only true for 8, 9, and 10. And the contacts, calls, SMS, and maps, all in the same location. Um, maps is still having the same issue that I found with iOS 10, where the data just isn't stored in a human readable format in this location, or it's stored somewhere else and we don't have access to it. So still missing, still to be determined on where it is. And again, you'll get access to these so you don't have to sit here and write down these paths. So once I did that, everything seemed actually kind of boring. So I was looking through my device and I always do really easy things so I can find it. So my first iMessage I sent was to my husband and I wrote, ignore this text, just testing iOS 11. So I knew I sent that on September 20th and I knew I was communicating with him. From there, I sent a message to some of my friends that have Androids and then I was just sending just messages in general back and forth to see what it looked like to include emojis, to include um, any gifts or anything else so I could just see how all the things were stored. And that's where the not so much fun begins. Um, at this point, I was in a total panic because at first, let me actually go back a slide. At first, I was in Oxygen and I did not even see the SMS database. So my initial thought was, oh my God, it's encrypted. They're not letting us see the SMS database anymore. Then I looked in Axiom and I did not see the SMS database and I really started to panic. So then I went into Physical Analyzer and I saw the SMS database and I thought that was strange. So then I started loading different dumps into Axiom and Oxygen and what I realized is when those tools, and I could be wrong, if anyone from Axiom and Oxygen, this is totally an assumption. So if you're logged in and this is not the case, please let me know. But what I assume is when the tool cannot parse the data correctly, it almost puts the database in the background so that it can't, maybe you can't highlight or find what the errors are. And it seems that when it parsed it better, not completely because it's not doing it right, but when it parsed it in a better method, then the database was available. Um, I personally need my tool to give me access to the databases all the time because I know the tools cannot do it all. So just be careful. You should see the SMS database in your tool. If you use iBackupBot, you will have access to the SMS.db. So if your tool is not showing it to you, it's because something is going wrong and that's actually not good. It also could be that I tested it right away and they weren't rendering the iOS 11 data correctly. But my concern here is this is the same database that has been since the beginning of iOS. So it's not that it's a brand new file that they couldn't find, and they did parse some messages, but not all. So just be really, really careful when looking at that. So what did change in the SMS? The path is the same, the database that's used is the same, but the timestamps, some of them have an 18 digit value and some of them don't. So this 18 digit value, the first time I've ever seen this was iOS 11. Um, the tools do not like this. What I found is that the tools need the columns to have all the same um, data sets or integers in order to parse it correctly. There are also new columns that are added to the database. So what you'll find is if you're looking at older SMS databases from 10 and below, the columns have all been consistent. With iOS 11, new columns were added and they're actually used and they contain useful in information. The old columns will also be updated. So this is where it's your, you have old stuff, you have new stuff, you have some new tables, new columns and new timestamps and the tools were just really choking on it from what I've seen. So what this looks like, are you ready for this madness here? So we have here, this last date red, and this is the perfect example. This was for sent messages, so that's why you'll see some of them are zero, because it was a sent message, so you don't have the last time you read it, it was something you sent to someone. 
we have the old Mac Absolute timestamp, which is this one right here, this 527625024. That is our nine digit value. But then we actually have down at the bottom where we have these 18 digit values. And that was causing issues. And you'll know if you use these commercial tools, which most of us do, in the tools it has the little down arrow where it lets you select how do you want to render this data. And you have one option. You don't get three options. So if you try to convert this and normalize it into Mac Absolute, what I was seeing is just a giant nightmare of data. And here is another example. So conversation start date versus con start date. I named these specifically different so you could see it's pulling it from two different tables. What I found is from the messages table right here on this con start date, the tools actually like this and it could parse it. The issue is when this table was being used for the message for the conversation start date, the tools would either not parse it at all or parse it incorrectly. So you have to be careful here. So here is another, you can see the 18 digit values and the nine digit values. And then I did my normal queries. So at this point, I know how to convert date timestamps. I started writing my queries to actually fix this. And this is what I started seeing. So I had a negative date, which makes absolutely no sense. I had no idea what was going on here, but I could see the stuff that happened before I updated it. So 9-19-2017 was before I had updated. If you look at this conversation start date right here that I'm highlighting on, this 9-20-2017, that is actually my first iOS 11 message. So everything before that was fine, and it all looks fine over here. It's just as soon as iOS 11 was implemented, that's when the nightmares occurred. So at this point, I reached out to Sarah, and I asked Sarah, and if you don't know which Sarah I'm talking about, I'm talking about Sarah Edwards. She is my Mac go-to person. And I asked her, what the heck is this date timestamp? What's happening? And she recommended that I use the EPOC converter from Blackbag. It's free and it works really well. So that's literally what I started doing. I started putting in these date timestamps. And if you go back here, you can see I was just trying to round up or fix this so that I could get to my date timestamp. So here, when I entered it, it then converted it back, but it was showing the 9 20 2017 and that it was actually working. However, this tool is not helping me in my query. So what I did not want to do is sit here and have to go manually, like copy and paste each of these dates. I needed my query to actually accept that it may be zero, it may be 18 digits, it may be nine digits in length. So that's where I started losing my mind. So on the left here, and this is tiny, the query here, what I did do as well is on my GitHub at the end, I will point out, I put this query, not this one, because this one has a problem, but the correct one in a text file, if you copy it straight from my blog post and paste it into a database tool, it's not going to work because it changes the quotes and changes some of the format. Um, WordPress just does something bad to it. So do not use that. Don't worry about how small this font looks. The point is here, when we are looking at what would normally work for Mac Absolute, it just was not working. So here, this was literally just taking my date timestamps and trying to do what you're seeing over here. So it worked on some, but not the 18 digits. So that is when I decided to phone a friend. And this is where Lee gets to step in. So by phone a friend, Heather actually sent me a chat message on a Friday and said, hey, I know you like dealing with timestamps. We have a whole section of that in our 585 day one um, course where we go over how to manually parse SQLite databases. So I said, sure, I'll take a look at it. So she explained the problem, which she mentioned earlier. She saw her Mac absolute nine digit value timestamps. She was able con to convert them, but she also had columns that had these new 18 digit timestamps. So I thought about it for a little while and said, you know, if we could just get that 18 digit value down to a nine digit value that looked like Mac, Mac Absolute, would we be able to convert it using the same um, timestamp converter? So first I pulled out my trusty um, 
calculator application on my computer, started typing in that number, and I think my calculator went up to about 14 digits. So I said, hmm, that's not gonna work for me. So I thought, you know what, this is how I normally do it for work. I'm just gonna throw it into my SQLite database browser and run the query from there because I know it can handle this. So basically, we're gonna try to get that 18 digit value down to something that looks familiar to us, and we're gonna see if that Mac absolute time conversion works. So what we did there is we took that 18 digit value, and if we divide it by 1 billion, which was one with nine zeros after it, it did look like a Mac absolute timestamp. So I wanted to create a small data set to test this theory. And I asked Heather to share her SMS database with me, and for some reason she didn't want to do that. I'm not exactly sure why. I mean, we've known each other for almost 30 years. Why in the world would she not want to share her SMS database? So instead, she sent me over a couple of values. So I figured it would be probably a little bit easier if I just isolated the information that I was trying to decode and then um, come up with a very simple query just to see if, if what I was thinking would work. So that's what I did here. This is one of my favorite free tools. This is the SQLite database browser. And in this tool, I went up and I clicked new database. I added a table and I called it messages. And in that table, I added one field and we're calling that timestamp. And then once I have the new database created, which is just simply a database that holds one value messages um, with a timestamp column, I went in and I added a couple of new rows. And in those new rows, I was going to input Heather's timestamp values that she shared with me. So as you can see, I took those 18 digit values and then I ran a simple query which was using the Mac absolute time, which we knew worked. We divided that by 1 billion, and I wanted to see if that would convert the timestamps correctly. So I ran it through real quickly. I came up with a couple of results. I shared them with Heather and said, hey, did these match up to what you, you know, when you sent those messages? And they did. So that was great. But we still have that issue of how we account for the differences in the columns. So like Heather mentioned before, most of our tools, um, they give us that drop down menu that says, hey, I wanna convert everything in this column to Mac Absolute, or I wanna uh, convert everything to Unix Epic. But in our case, we had multiple different values and we couldn't choose to convert three different values three different ways. So we had to add a little bit more information to our data set. So we went back and added our regular nine digit timestamps and we also added in those zeros. So this is where the query got um, a little bit more exciting for us because we hadn't done this before. We were really dealing with just one, um, one type of timestamp before. So as you can see here, we have our new dates, 18 digit, digit values. We have our Mac absolute nine digit values. And you notice how the simple query that we created is leaving us with what looks like incorrect timestamps. I mean, Heather, did you really send all of these SMS messages on 1231 at um, 2000? Did you even have your phone? I think I still had my <laughs> Blackberry. <laughs> okay, so we knew that was incorrect. So a quick chat with Heather proved that, okay, that's still not working correctly. So we need to do something a little bit further. Actually, I think I had a flip phone. Yeah, that would in make, 2000. I think I had a Nextel flip phone. That would make a lot more sense. That could have been when you had your long skinny phone. <laughs> My razor. Okay, so how are we going to get around this issue? So what we want to do in our queries, we want to tell our query, when you see an 18 digit timestamp, handle it one way. When you see the nine digit, handle it a different way. And then if you see anything else, like in our case um, with this particular column, if it was zeros, we want to do a third thing. So that is where um, we use these case statements within our SQLite query to separate out what we're interested in. So you can see that we also apply the date timestamp to any 18 um, digit column and we divide by 1 billion and that's how we get our answer. 
when we have a regular MAC absolute time stamp, which is nine digits, we use the regular MAC absolute time conversion. And then here, if it's anything else, in our case, zeros, but I tested this, and when I say anything else, that could be um, any an X, my name, anything other than an 18-digit integer or a 19-digit integer, it's going to return an NA. So we tested this quickly on our query, and fortunately for us, it looks like now we have normal timestamps. And like Heather mentioned before, those 920 dates, those were her 18-digit integers. Those ones that happened before 920, those were the old Mac absolute times. And here, where the message was sent, so it wasn't read, those are appearing as NA. And then this is how we got the mother of all queries. And I have to give Adrian Leong, the cheeky forensic monkey, um, credit for calling it that. So it literally here throws in everything. So all of the columns you need that are brand new, whether your forensic tools parse them or not, um, the date, time, case, conditions. And then if we keep going down, you can see it joins all the tables together. So all the attachments and whether or not they're created in the type and total bytes, all of those items are listed there. And then you can see down here how I have it ordered. You can change that if you want. You don't need to have that there. But this actually works and it works well. It does not care about, um, it doesn't rely on everything like your forensic tool may. So it doesn't care how you got access to the database. You just need the database. The only thing I have to mention is if you try to run this and it does not have iOS 11 data in it, you're going to get errors because it's going to say, I can't find this table or this column doesn't exist because that was introduced with iOS 11. But if you do have an iPhone or an iPad that has iOS 11 data in it, it will still go back and parse all the way from the beginning of iOS messaging. So you would get seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11 data. But keep in mind, it was written to primarily support iOS 11. So some of these tables and columns in here are specific to 11 data. And here's a snippet. And a lot of this is redacted because like Lee said, I'm not sharing my SMS database with anyone. I'm not that crazy. I actually had three people ask me for it during this testing. But what you can see here is I'm having conversations with people. So this one down here, I'm actually talking with Cindy Murphy. And you can see we're talking about taking screenshots. We were having some acquisition issues that we were reporting back to the vendor. Over here, we can see our phone numbers, our date timestamps, and everything was actually converted correctly. Um, this guy right here for this next step, these little emojis caused my next nightmare. So here you can see there's 46,200 messages, which is crazy. I have a lot of text messages since iOS 7 stored here, and I delete a lot of them. So these are just my active messages being shown here. But what we realize now is how many people are going to take this query and export out their database and use some kind of database tool to actually run their own query to get a spreadsheet and have correct answers. And I can let you just guess how many. Most people are going to say, you know what, forget it. I'm just gonna go into my forensic tool and if it's showing me a date from 2036 that that text message was sent, so be it, the tool is broken. But that's what we don't want to happen. What we hope is that you will use these queries and use a tool like Database Browser for SQLite that Lee was talking about to get your own results and get the correct results. But because we know how all of us are, and I'm not gonna lie, I've fallen into this category as well, nobody wants to do that. So I then decided, because I'm crazy and I have tons of free time, that I was gonna try to take this query and put it into a Python script. Um, that may seem redundant to a lot of people, but some people will not do those steps we just talked about. So out here on my GitHub, and I'm actually gonna escape out of the presentation for a second and go into my GitHub because I wanna show you this. What you're going to see is the iOS SMS parser. That's the Python script that's going to do exactly what the query does. But then you also have the query down here. So if you go down here, you're gonna see, this is where you can get that text file to copy and paste into your tool. Over here is where you can get the Python script that's going to do all of 
the things the query does for you. It's just literally you say, hey, here's my SMS database, and this is what I want the output file to be. And by default, it's going to spit out to a TSV, so you can open it in Excel, and it works. Where it does not work on Windows, and this is just a warning here, emojis. Emojis in Windows, it just looks awful. So if you see something that does not look like normal human readable data, and that's all that's in that line, it's probably an emoji. Or if you see where it's broken up in between, it's probably an emoji. Where this does work well is in Linux. So everyone can download the SanSift workstation as a sanity check if you're seeing that, and it will look fine there. It's just Windows doesn't render that data correctly. Um, Adrian Leong, the cheeky forensic monkey, helped me greatly with this. Um, he was very, very patient with me on trying to figure out the Unicode issues, that's what we initially thought it was. And then we realized it wasn't Unicode issues that was causing it. It was when I text, I somehow hit return frequently. And when I was asking the output, I was telling it to, every time it found a new column to tab. So it was taking messages and putting it into an entire new row and making it look crazy just because of my lazy texting that I do. I could fix it, but who wants to fix a text message? So if I send you a text that says I am here and it's in three different rows, so be it. Like that's just the way I'm gonna leave it because I'm typing too fast. So it accounts for all of those things if you go out to my GitHub and grab that. Um, also, one other thing that I wanna point out that's iOS 11 related. If you go out to, hmm, yes. That was perfect. <laughs> to Three Planet Software. Um, this SQLite Miner is one that I've been using a lot in iOS 10 and 11. Um, what this is doing, this was one of my students who took this class just a little bit ago, and he was frustrated with how the commercial tools were showing the iCloud notes for iOS 10 and 11 and they contain a lot of blobs, and it was not rendering them at all, so we couldn't see how it was parsing it. So his Perl script, the SQLite Miner, goes through and identifies what's actually in those blobs for you so that you can actually go through and parse them. And it's nice, it creates a new database with all the parsed information so you can actually read it, but it also exports, if it can, it will export out any of the pictures, if the blobs are gzip files, whatever's in there that it knows how to support, it's gonna push those out for you. So then you could actually examine them. It's a really cool script. I highly recommend it. Um, if you take 585 with Lee, Cindy, or I, um, you will come across this script. And if you're taking 585 this upcoming week with Jess or Mattia, they will show you the script as well. And we're actually going to be putting this query and this script into 585 in the upcoming classes. With all of this, what we cannot stress enough is you need to create your own test data. Um, I probably get about, it could be up to 10 emails a day at this point with people just asking, can you recommend a tool for this? Um, can you tell me what this date timestamp means? Can you tell me what X means? in this app when I choose to archive versus white versus delete. And while we are very curious and we love to help, this isn't something that we can do because we have full-time jobs. So you have to create your own test data. The next thing I hear from people is, well, I don't have all of these phones, they're really expensive. And like Lee just showed you, you don't need a phone to do that. She was literally making up a fake database to match what we were seeing in the evidence, because this was a perfect situation. I was not willing to give her my SMS database, but I needed help. You may be helping someone that's working an investigation where they cannot give you access to their evidence, and you may have to recreate the, the data to look that way. Um, we've had situations where people wanna know how do pictures get on a device? What can this app do? Why is there, um, can malware put pictures into a browser and make it look like the person was looking at something inappropriate. All these things can occur and how we know it occurs is because we test it. So you are going to be a stronger examiner if you create your own test data. That's honestly, I would say I learn more creating test data than I do actually working cases because then you can say without a doubt in your mind, 
I know how this data got here because I've tested it myself. And something that's going to occur is these apps change quickly, these iOS versions change quickly, it's not going to stay the same. So it looked one way in August, and this is something I'm dealing with today, is going to look different today because a new column may have been added. Um, the Mac date timestamp may now be 18 digits instead of nine. So you are going to have to dig into your data, know what you're looking for, and then create test data to make sense of it. Now, do you have to go out and write your own scripts and queries? No, there's a whole group of us that like to post stuff publicly. So if you are searching around, I would say get on Twitter and see what people are up to and what people are recommending. Um, read my blog, read Cindy's blog, read Sarah Edwards' blog to see what scripts do we recommend, what actually helps us get to the end of the road when it comes to finding data on smartphones. Um, I would also recommend that you take 585. Now, if you're interested in Mac specific, you could also take 518, which is the Mac forensics class. 585 is all mobile. 518 does cover iOS as well. And clearly where the data stored is going to be the same, but all the labs are completely different. Everything you would do in 518, the Mac class is done on a Mac. Everything you would do in 585 is done in Windows, or you could do some of it actually in the SIFT workstation in Linux. And if you have a Mac, you're welcome to do that as well, but it's just taught on a Windows VM. Um, we do have a cert with our class. Unfortunately, it's called GASP, so you <laughs> pass GASP. And I joke that I'll get stickers made with like a little burst of air saying, congratulations, you passed GASP. But until then, you just get to say GASP. Um, this class, we have 20 labs technically, so 19 hands-on labs. They are completely different scenarios every single time you touch a lab. So it's not that you have one data set that you look at from different perspectives. It's literally different devices, different operating systems. Um, you'll face encryption. You will face locked devices, locked backups, um, wiped devices. And then you have a forensic challenge where you put three different smartphones together. Something else I always hear is, I don't wanna take your training, I heard it's a Celebrate class, and that is definitely not true. It is vendor neutral. Do we use commercial tools? Absolutely. Um, you will be able to get your feet wet with a ton of the tools in the class, but the goal is for you to learn how much can you trust these tools, how far can they take you, and then when do you have to take the reins? So when do you have to take control of your investigation and say, okay, I care about X, Y, and Z, and guess what, X is not supported. So what am I gonna do next? That's what we hope to teach you is what are you going to do next? Because the data changes so fast, our goal is to teach you core concepts so you know what to do when there's a change. You know how to approach application analysis and all these databases. So that's what we hope you get out of the course. Um, other references other than our course, um, you'll see, the time is not on our side when it comes to messages in iOS 11. I'm gonna escape out again. This is the primary reason we did this webcast. Um, this blog post had a ton of traffic and people seem to really like it. And in here you'll see, I do show what the tools were doing and I'll let you read this on your own. And it literally breaks through the entire story on what Lee and I just told you, minus how we came up with that query in the end. So I recommend that you read that one. Um, if you're curious about tools, everyone always asks me this, so now I'm posting people to come right here. What I believe from my own experience that my tools are good at, where they're strong, where they're weak, and this covers everything from commercial tools to scripts that people in the community wrote. Um, to refer back to Cindy's blog, um, previously encrypted iOS backups. This is her Gilware blog here. This is the one I recommend that you read. And the links for all of that, Carol will be sending out and it's posting. So you can see that's what's listed here. Um, my GitHub is listed up here. I also listed John's GitHub down here at the bottom of Three Planet Software for that SQLite miner that I recommend you look at. And then finally, um, where we're leaving this is the courses that are upcoming. So CDI is just a little over a month away and it's in DC. 
This is the last live course we're running in 2017. This is also where we are launching our brand new challenge coin, which is up here. So if you come and take the class, you will understand what all of this means on this brand new challenge coin. And you will be one of the first four people to own that coin. Um, in 2018, we are back in the DC area. Lee and I are co-teaching in Bethesda. And then we are co-teaching in Dallas. Cindy's going overseas to London and then back in Orlando and San Diego. Um, we are traveling to Paris next year, I believe Sweden, as well as London, possibly Australia, and I wanna say Prague, I believe. So we will be worldwide. Um, you can also take it on demand at any time. Right now, I am not aware of a VLive class that's scheduled, but usually those run late spring to summer. and it's always fun, I think, to take live training, but a lot of people like on demand and be live because they can do it at their own pace. Does anyone have any questions? And one thing I want to highlight too the San Diego class down there, you'll see simulcast. Simulcast gives you the live classroom experience, but from your home. So you literally just join from your home or your workplace every day and you are literally a part of the classroom. You have a moderator who asks questions for you. You get to hear all the student questions. So it's completely interactive. Even when you work your forensic challenge, you will be assigned to a team in the classroom. It's really cool how it works. When I was doing simulcast in Vegas, I had the group that was in the classroom had their teammate from Paris do the presentation. So everything is possible. And if you're interested in taking training but you just can't travel due to budget or time, it's something you may want to consider. Questions. Hey Heather, it's Carol. Um, I do see one question that asks, uh, do you have Cindy's blog? Yes, Cindy's blog, let me go back. If you go to Gilware, dot com forward slash forensics forward slash blog you will see her latest blogs and she wrote two recently her one on windows forensics that she wrote last week was awesome very very useful on someone trying to install a new operating system and make changes as well as the one that she just wrote on ios encryption The reason I wasn't seeing the question, sorry about that, Craig, is I was in the chats window. Any other questions? Okay, we'll stay logged in for a minute or so. Um, if you have questions after the fact that you just didn't want to ask live on the blog, you can feel or on the webcast, you can feel free to email us, and I'll go to our contact information slide again. And you can always access the slides later. We hope to see you in a class if you haven't attended already. Um, if you have taken one of our classes, thank you for joining in for the changes. Um, I plan to look more into iOS 11 and start looking at some of the log files and things that are new and the new features. Um, I just got my iPhone 10 this week and I'm trying not to shatter it until I get my case. But anything that I find new on the iPhone 10, um, I also am going to start looking into Android 8 with Oreo. So stay tuned for more webcasts. Um, Cindy and I have one planned for March. So if not before then, that's when I will see you again. All right. Well, thank you so much, Heather and Lee, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sands.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.